Somehow I remembered that when this uh, passage came up, three, came up three years ago, I mentioned that one of the really treasured things that I have from my grandfather on my mom's side is this old family Bible that he brought over from Norway, which has been passed down now for nearly a century and a half. It sits on our piano, place of honor. It is known as a Doré Bible. It was produced originally around 1865. What we have, I looked just uh, yesterday, and it was about 1885, that the volume that we have. So it's terribly old, wonderful. It's basically a volume of his engravings from scripture with but a Bible verse at the bottom of each one of them, serving as a caption to each picture. Doré was a very celebrated artist. He illustrated works by Poe and Shakespeare and Dante and a bunch of others whose names you would recognize. Anyway, in this collection of what probably was about a hundred of these engravings is one of this morning's story in which a man who tradition names as Dives, simply Latin for rich man, and he is seen in the upper right hand of the page having dinner with a bunch of his friends only outnumbered by the servants that are serving him. And then we also find Lazarus the beggar. He's sort of sprawled out and collapsed on the steps leading up to the porch where they're having this sumptuous meal. And then there are four dogs there that are just getting ready to lick his sores. Now, one immediately notices that the dogs don't seem to be bothering Lazarus. In fact, they actually look like they're providing him company and trying to help. Remember, in first century Palestine, dogs were considered basically cast out. As an aside, it seems like there is actually medical evidence to suggest that dogs licking a sore actually help a wound to heal. And contained in their saliva is this protein called histidins, which some believes wards off infection and helps close sores more easily and quickly. And Dr. Bushnell undoubtedly will be talking about this at coffee hour, right? <laughs> Three years ago, I ended my sermon that day by saying, as I did last week, that in parables, there's always a Christ figure. And it was and still remains my contention that if the usual candidates for that honor are Dives and Lazarus and the brothers out on town, or even Abraham, I'm going to take the unlikely dogs. After all, it was the dogs that showed mercy to Lazarus while he suffered on earth. The others, including Abraham, didn't. Dives had a sumptuous dinner, and poor Lazarus, of course, had nothing. Now, if you think this is unfair, you're looking at the story from a vantage point of 2,000 years removed. In the first century, Dives, who obviously had a pretty successful light, was thought to frankly deserve the dinner, which was on his plate, which he probably did. Whereas beggars, like Lazarus, being poor in biblical times, probably had it coming to him. The crummy life, that is, because he undoubtedly sinned. In much of the thinking back then, you basically got what you deserved. Now, in certain cases, we understand that. That's what happens today. But that particular point from a theological perspective gave the story of Job, for example, a real punchline. If you remember from Job's situation, no one could figure out why bad things were happening to him because he was so sound in every aspect of his life. And then at the end, when the divine joke was over, Job was rewarded with even more stuff than he had when the whole story started. Having more stuff was equated to having lived a more righteous life in many cases. And all this is to say that Dives is not the bad man that we think he is, at least to those who were first hearing this story in the first century. He was probably seen as a fine, upstanding citizen. And that is really, really important, I think, to get the gist of this story. Everything that happened after he died would have stunned the people hearing Jesus' parable. 
just made no sense that Dives went to hell and Lazarus to heaven. They would have thought just the opposite would have been more likely and appropriate if they were inclined to believe in an afterlife. And you remember, Sadducees and Herodians did not think in the after, believe an afterlife was there, but the Pharisees very much did. And so it would have been very much in the, in the thinking of the people listening to it. The second problem they would have probably raised with the parable was that Abraham was concerned with the wrong guy. Given that Lazarus was unjustly already in heaven, would not Abraham have been more bothered that one of Jerusalem's finest was in a world of hurt? No wonder Dives held out, boy, fetch. Here was a fellow who was very used to people serving him, and his religion and society, the Moriars thereof, approved of it all. But now the tables were turned, and in fact, Abraham couldn't help Dives, even if he was so inclined. After all, there was now a great gulf between them. And then comes the kicker around which many sermons revolve. Well, pleaded Dives, could you send him to warn my five brothers? Hey, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them, replied Abraham. Dives said, but still, if someone would just rise from the dead, that would do the trick. And Abraham responded, it won't work. Sorry. Well, when we hear this, we can easily get off the track, thinking that all this is about is that being rich gets you into hell, but being poor gets you into heaven. <laughs> if that is the case, we are in a world of hurt, and we are toast because we have much compared to what the world understands as little. And we ought to just go home admitting that we are those people who are rich and then watch the lines take on the Packers on Fox. It's channel 510 if you feel so inclined and are depressed. Coming on the heels of such a notion, of course, this being the time when parishes begin stewardship of financial resources programs is the obvious. If you don't want to wind up like Divas, give some money away, hopefully to the church into other places, and you will avoid eternal punishment. Kind of lighten the load. Sadly, throughout history, that threat has worked very well. But it's terrible theology, utterly terrible theology. You cannot possibly buy your way into heaven with good works and generous giving. Even if you have everything and give it all away, it's not going to do the trick. We get there by the grace and love of God as a consequence of God's love. So that leaves a third obvious item. If someone would just rise from the dead, where have we heard that one before? And tell folks not getting it what's in store for them, if they do not repent, then the whole thing is going to be fine. Well, we think of Christ. But if we really think of Christ, we remember we were not informed by a risen Christ as to what particularly good behavior will get us into heaven. But rather, we are saved by a risen Christ from the power of sin and the sting of death. As a consequence, we repent not to avoid fire and damnation, but we repent to live within this tremendous power of eternal life changing not just ourselves, but the totality of the world that is around us. That's why we repent and come closer to a risen Christ. And here, I think, is the most important part of the whole story. Remember when the conversation turned irreversibly hopeless for the rich man. It really was that moment when Abraham told him, Man, I'd really like to help out, but between you in hell and us, Abraham and Lazarus, in heaven, this great chasm has been fixed so that those who might want to pass from here to you cannot do so, and to pass from you to here cannot do the same. Yet, you and I now know better. Because of the resurrection, that assertion of a chasm has been reduced to a bag of shells. And with that divide, no longer a fact of life, relishing eternal life here and now becomes possible for every single one of us. Every year at Easter, those in the Eastern Orthodox Church of the Byzantine Rite 
Listen to St. John Chrysostom's sermon that he gave at Easter 1,600 years ago, which spoke of a new truth, a truth for Lazarus, a truth for Dives and his dinner companions, and most certainly even a truth for the dogs that were licking the sores of their hopeless friend. And here are just a few lines from that sermon that you have heard from me before, usually at Easter. But this time I'm using a translation that's penned by my friend of 30 years, the Reverend Mary Beth Rivetti, who's a brilliant classic scholar and uh, retired of St. James Church in Pullman, Washington. This is what he said. Held down by death, Christ put it out. He went down to a place of death and punished death. Death took a body and happened upon God. Death took earth and it encountered heaven. Death grabbed wherever he could see and fell over what he couldn't see. Where death is your sting, where death is your victory. Christ is risen and you have been cast down. Christ is risen and the demons have fallen. Christ is risen and the angels rejoice. Christ is risen and not one who has died remains in the tomb. For Christ, having been raised from the dead, has become the first fruit sacrifice of those who've been laid to rest. To him be glory and power forever and ever. So Dives, the servants, Lazarus, and even the dogs now rest well together. As has been said, and I only wish I could remember who it was, it was quoted in a sermon as perhaps a Roman Catholic archbishop who once opined, we are compelled by scripture to believe in the existence of hell, but we are not compelled to believe that anyone is there. That's grace. And grace is powerful enough to include every single one of us into the kingdom of God here and now. Let's go out and tell people that. They are, after all, starving for good news. Amen. Amen.